Many years ago, Al Capone virtually owned the city of Chicago. Uh, he wasn't famous for anything heroic, we know that. He was notorious for enmeshing the windy city and everything from bootlegged booze to prostitution to murder. Al Capone had a lawyer nicknamed Easy Eddie. He was Al Capone's uh, lawyer for a really good reason because Eddie was really good at what he did. He helped Al Capone uh, set up uh, illegal enterprises. In fact, his skill at maneuvering Big Al kept him out of jail for a long time. To show his appreciation, Al Capone paid him really a good salary. Not only was the money big, but Eddie got special dividends as well. For instance, he and his family occupied a fenced-in mansion with live-in help all, with all the conveniences of that day. The estate was so big that it filled an entire city block in Chicago, where Easy Eddie lived. He lived the high life with a Chicago mob and gave little consideration for the atrocities that were going on around him. But Eddie had one soft spot. He had a son that he dearly, dearly loved. And Eddie saw to it that his young son had everything he needed, clothes, cars, good education. He didn't hold anything back because money was no object. Despite his involvement with organized crime, Eddie even tried to teach his son right from wrong. Uh, he wanted his son to be a better man than he was. Yet, with all his wealth and influence, there are two things that he could not give to his son. He couldn't pass on a good name, and talked about in a sermonette, he could not pass on a good example. His example was not very good. One day, Easy Eddie uh, reached a very difficult decision. He'd been stewing about it for quite a while, and he wanted to rectify some of the wrongs in his life. Uh, maybe he saw the handwriting on a wall, or maybe he just uh, uh, got very altruistic, but he decided to clean up his tarnished name the best he could and offer his son a semblance of integrity. To do this, he would have to testify against Al Capone and the mob. And he knew that the price would be great. So he testified, and he helped the government bring Al Capone to justice on tax fraud evasion charges in 1931. He went to jail for tax, for tax purposes. Easy Eddie's life ended in a blaze of gunfire on a lonely Chicago street on November the 8th, 1939. The evidence points to a hit ordered by Al Capone. But in his eyes, he had given his son the greatest gift he had to offer, the greatest price he could ever pay. When police arrived, uh, they removed from his pocket a rosary, a crucifix, a religious medallion, and he clipped out a little poem from a magazine, a short poem. The poem said, Quote, the clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop, at late or early hour. Now is the only time you own. Live, love, toil with a will. Place no faith in time, for the clock may soon be still. So he was laid to rest. I'll get back to that. There's a purpose for it. But this universe that God has designed is filled with beautiful laws, some having to do with cause and effect. We see God's same law-abiding nature in laws that help govern our lives. There are principles of cause and effect in our human conduct. And one of them is, and that's what I would like to address uh, this morning, we reap what we sow. We reap what we sow, nationally, organizationally, personally. 
we understand the concept of physical sowing, physical reaping. I mean, I just went to Regina on a church circuit. Crops are all doing good. It's like a, an ocean of wheat just waving in the wind under the prairie sky, beautiful. But the ground is prepared for the crop. Uh, the rocks are taken out or crushed or uh, rolled over. The farmer scatters seed on the ground, which has been prepared. And at some point in the fall, the, uh, or whenever, the harvest takes place. You know, out in the prairies in Canada and here in the States, they have combines that can harvest 25 acres of wheat per hour. Amazing. One guy. 25 acres of wheat per hour. Reaping and sowing is an inviolate principle. It's like gravity. We can't get away from it. We can't pretend it does not exist. Plowing and sowing are deliberate activities. We might not recognize our plowing. We might not recognize our sowing. But they're there, day by day, year by year. People reap the trouble which they sow. Nations reap the troubles which they sow. But also we reap the good that we sow. We can leave vapor trails in our lives, just like high-flying jet aircraft. Job chapter 4 and verse 8 thought about this during the time of his trial as he observed human behavior, an observer of life. And he said, Job 4, verse 8, Even as I have seen those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. Those who plow iniquity, sow trouble, reap the same. It comes back. Recently this week, we've had political upheaval in the province of Alberta. Our first female premier resigned, and then she resigned her seat. And it all boiled down to the fact that she sowed seeds of self-indulgence, use of corporate aircraft and so on for personal gain or personal use. And she reaped the public outcry and an RCMP investigation. Came back to haunt her, ruined her career. I got, uh, years ago in the ministry, I got a, a visitor request from a uh, lady way up in northern Quebec. Lived, we're living in Sudbury, Ontario. So myself and my assistant, we drove up there pretty well on an all-day drive. She was kind of distraught and uh, kind of hard to get her to open up. She had a little child kind of wobbling around uh, in front of us in the living room. Obviously, the child was not well. She was in tears. She wanted to know if God would ever forgive her. And she went on to explain what happened. That uh, when she was expecting, she tried to perform an abortion by herself, unsuccessfully, and uh, ended up with a retarded child. I think of the scripture, my sin is ever before me. And uh, of course, we tried to encourage her, read Romans chapter 7, but Unfortunately, because of stupidity, uh, something crazy happened. Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 8. Proverbs 22 and verse 8. <clears throat> so he who sows iniquity will reap sorrow. In other words play with fire, you can get burnt. If you abuse your body, you might get sick, or a pain is suffering. If you sow hatred, you reap strife. Reap strife. This is different than someone uh, who uh, slips than one who sows evil. This is different than someone who has an occasional kind deed as one who sows good. 
Let's go to uh, the, the, the national principle of Israel in Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. Hosea chapter 8 and verse 7. Hosea is talking about the nation of Israel. Short statement. They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The context is the idolatry of Israel is so much blustery wind. As a consequence, Israel reaped a whirlwind of trouble as they got involved with breaking God's law, breaking the covenant agreement with their creator. In fact, Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26 are principles of we reap what we sow, either good or bad, blessings or cursings. Hosea chapter 10, uh, verses 12 to 13. Just read that. So God is pleading with the nation. He said, sow for yourselves righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the eternal, till he comes and rains righteousness on you. That's what God wants us to sow. Righteousness. But, he said, verse 13, you have plowed wickedness. You have reaped iniquity. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you trusted in your own way in a multitude of your mighty men. Things haven't changed. They haven't changed. Now you look at what happened in 2008, the financial crisis. We're attempting still to avoid harvesting the crop that was sown prior to 2008. A lot of North America was on a get-rich-quick scheme. People bought homes they could not afford, leveraged them, thinking they could sell at a higher price. The bottom fell out, foreclosures hit, real estate market dropped. And the whole idea of a stimulus package is to try to circumvent the principle of reaping what we sow. So the solution in man's eyes is get more debt. To get out of debt, get deeper in debt. The, uh, again, the, the Bible shows that uh, we need to be generous in the, thing, the good things that we sow because the blessings will be there. In the early church, they had a, a, a church crisis uh, involving famine, uh, involving uh, a shortage of food, and they had their good works program back then. Uh, so. The Corinthian church was among those that helped organize a relief effort for those in Judea. And Paul addressed the issue about sowing and reaping in 2 Corinthians 9. And I'll just read a few verses. Uh, verse 5, because they were coming around to collect and take uh, food produce and take it to uh, those in need. He said, Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. And he said, verse, uh, verse 6, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. You want a good crop? Don't skimp on a seed. Seed is relatively cheap. Last year in Canada, they had a bumper crop. And uh, I think the farmers are hoping to have another one. But <laughs> you've got to prime the pump. You have to put the seed in there. And then uh, a lot of it is faith after that. And you're dependent on circumstances beyond your control weather and hail. He said in verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, 
verse 9, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies the seed to the sower, you know, it's a team effort. God could do it all himself if he wanted to, but we're part of the crop, but we're also part of the labor. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruit of your righteousness. And he equated this, that God will be glorified, verse 13, through their liberal giving, liberal sharing. We had a theme for the GCE on uh, creating an environment for spiritual growth. Excellent theme. And uh, just at, around the time of that theme, I was reading a book um, on the subject of evil, actually. <laughs> There's two books, uh, Marketing of Evil, uh, one of them. But uh, the author talked about a speech that James Dobson gave 2002 to about 3,500 people. Uh, and he asked the question, do you understand what a stem cell is? A stem cell is a cell, in a human being at least, that in the very early stages of development is undifferentiated. In other words, it's not yet any kind of tissue, but it can go in any direction depending on the environment that is put in, stem cell. The stem cell, if it's in the brain, develops into a nerve cell or into the substance between the nerves. Or if it's in the heart, it becomes a heart cell. Or if it's in the eye, it becomes a part of the eyeballs. Wherever it is, it takes on the characteristics of the surrounding area. And he talked about children. And you know, we're God's children. He said, do you understand that children are the stem cells for the culture? The environment that you put them in is what they will grow up to be. If you can control what they hear, if you can control what they're told, if you have access to their minds, you may make them into just about whatever you wish. They could be molded. And uh, rightfully so, uh, uh, there's an emphasis on um, having our congregations warm, friendly environments where God is calling children, they can fit in and uh, you know, have an easy time becoming a part of the body of Jesus Christ in a very comfortable way. When we were raising our, our, our two girls, and my wife and I, I had this poem framed, it was on you know, nice, nice font and a color paper, I had it framed. We looked at it for years I'm not going to read it, copyright issues, but you can download it. Uh, it's entitled Children Learn What They Live by Dorothy Law Nolte, Ph.D. And I'm, probably a lot of you have read it anyway, but it talks about in it, the effect of an environment of criticism or hostility or fear or pity or ridicule or jealousy or shame, and how it molds children. And she contrasts that with an environment of encouragement, tolerance, praise, acceptance, approval, recognition, sharing, honesty, fairness, kindness, and how that impacts children. Even in parenting, sometimes we reap what we sow. It's, it's a tough job. It's a challenge. You know, the principle goes all across life. There's a proverb, if you want to have friends, show yourself friendly, right? Simple principle. Christ talked about it in parables, uh, Matthew 13. Matthew 13, verse 3. 
Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. I think whenever I read this, I think of that uh, Walt Disney movie about Johnny Appleseed went across the United States, had this bag of seeds, and he kept uh, you know, planting apple trees all across the states. And we're doing that through the Internet <laughs> around the world. Seeds are dropping all over the place. In Canada, we get continuous responses to the television program, to our internet efforts, our literature. Seeds continue to be sown and dropped. And as he sowed, verse 4, some fell by the wayside. Birds came and devoured them. No guarantee, is there? Some fell on stony places, didn't have much earth. They sprang up because they had no depth of earth. Sun was up, they were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. Some fell among thorns. Thorns sprung up, choked them. Others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some 60 and some 30. Years ago, like in my original Bible, I got ambassador to college with the you know, wide margins and uh, this was back in the 60s. And I read that. I started writing names in the four categories. People I knew that fit those categories at that time. So Christ explains, verse 18, Therefore hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what's sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. I had a close friend, Ian, when I started getting literature from the church. We're in junior high. And we would walk to school two miles. We just, I'd discuss all the stuff I was learning with him. Bring along the Painter's Magazine. And, here, and then I'd say, oh, you read it. And he'd read it, mark it all up. X's disagreed with everything. So I wrote his name there. <laughs> okay. Verse 20, but he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a little while before when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he stumbles. And there are some people who get so excited, so turned on, so enthusiastic. They come to services, they want to serve, they'll get baptized. A year later, they're gone, whatever reason. Verse 22, now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. I could think of names then. And we had a major split back in uh, 1995 a lot of people in the church were involved with pyramid uh, schemes of selling. And all of a sudden, <coughs> changes came. Uh, they were off to meetings on Saturday to promote their products. All of a sudden, you say, I didn't think that was a high priority, but that's a higher, higher priority than the Sabbath. Shook my head. Verse 23, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word, understands it who indeed bears fruit and produces a hundredfold, 60, some 30. And I still have my name with a question mark in that category. <laughs> it's not over yet, okay? But that's where I want to be. There's a lot of things you can digest from this, but uh, you know, the type of soil can determine the bounty of the crop, obviously. And God also demands sometimes uh, uh, a harvest from areas he hasn't even sown. There's a scripture about that. But only a small amount of seed produces lasting fruit. Christ said, remember, narrow is the way, difficult, few are be to find it. So there's a lot of seed thrown, but the overall result is uh, not a high yield so far. <laughs> and not till the world tomorrow, the kingdom of God. But yet, Christ said, the fields are white to the harvest. We're told to pray for laborers. 
It's interesting at harvest time, foreign workers come to help har harvest the crop. The locals can't keep up with it. They come from across the border, they're hired to pick, harvest, because it's a lot of work. It doesn't take as much work to sow the seed, but the harvesting time. We have uh, one farmer I talked to in Regina, I was there about this. He said, yeah, of course, it's much more labor intensive during harvest time. No, Christ started with 12, pretty small seed, 120, not that much. And thousands began to be added. Verse 24, another parable he put forth saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Satan is so crafty. But when the grain has sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servant of the owner came and said, Sir, do you want, did we not sow good seed in the field? How come we've got tares? He said, the enemy has done this. The servant said, do you want us to go out and gather them up? He said, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. They're so connected, side by side sometimes. And you can do a lot of damage if you don't handle it in the right way. So Christ said, let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares, bind them up in bundles to burn them, gather the wheat into my barn. The lesson is that there will always be opposition. Paul, at times, talked about one of his hazards was false brethren. Not always obvious. I've learned, I've <laughs> been in the church for, uh, I don't know, 50 years or so. When a, when, a person, when a person sows discord, when they sow anger, when they sow suspicion, and distrust, you get division, factions, party spirits, malice, and hatred. A lot of times it just starts with the mouth. Satan is an expert at it. He's called the accuser of the brethren. But God will prevail. He will reap his harvest, thankfully. Beautiful. <laughs> I think there's a Protestant hymn about that. I like it. Psalm 126, verse 4 to 6. Psalms 126, uh, 4 to 6. It'll be a beautiful time when God harvests. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Beautiful harvest analogy. Sowing, reaping, spiritual crop. Uh, John 4, uh, 35 to 38. Let's read that also. John 4, 35 to 38. It says, do you not say there are still four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Just like the canola fields are turning beautiful yellow in the prairies now. Beautiful. And the, and the weeds are starting to form their head and the barley. If Christ said that back then, would he not say it emphatically today? Verse 36, and he who reaps receives wages and gathers fruit, notice, for eternal life, that both he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For this, uh, for in this a saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you've entered into their labors. I mean, when I was called into the church, a lot of others were laboring I was not aware of, and uh, they were putting, uh, paying for 
radio. They were paying for literature, booklets, and uh, I'm glad somebody was. <laughs> it could have changed my life. Galatians, this, this is a primary scripture I'm working toward. Galatians 6, uh, verse 6. Basically, the title of the sermon here in verse 7. Is it let him who is taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches? Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. That's the living law in life. And he goes on. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But, just like the principle of seek you first the kingdom of God, God knows our, our fleshly needs, but he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And that's what we need to be doing, continue to do. However, there's a factor. <laughs> Ran into one office employee, Carmelo and I were getting some stuff uh, at the uh, grocery store. The person said, I'm so tired. I'm so glad it's Friday. You know, it's been a long week. And God says, verse 9, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we don't lose heart. Sometimes it takes quite a while between the time you plant until the time you reap. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. The nations of Israel have been mocking God since the beginning. Yet, you cannot out outsmart sin. Sometimes there's a time delay between the sowing and the reaping. Good deeds are not always realized immediately. The crop we reap is determined by the seed we sow. Plowing occurs preparatory to the sowing. The ground we prepare also determines what crop you're able to reap. You have a different type of ground to grow rice and to grow vegetables, right? And, uh, you know, my wife grew up on a farm. She loves gardening. She loves planting. She's got a green thumb. Uh, I just find to stay away because I pull the wrong stuff out all the time. Uh, but I, I realize not everybody, everybody is good at, good at, uh, at horticulture. Some people are better at it than others. And uh, sometimes I think when the, in the church, sometimes we feel, well, I know as much as everybody. Uh, and uh, sometimes some people know a little bit more <laughs> about certain things. This is something, you know, we, uh, there, uh, or this is uh, kind of a weekend for young people this afternoon especially. And it's so important to sow good seeds in our youth, even from my youth, oh God. Remember? Book of Proverbs, designed for young people. Wonderful words of wisdom. William Galston, a University of Maryland professor of public policy, I think he even worked with Bill Clinton for a while, during the Clinton administration, uh, he found the following, these five steps gives a young person almost a 90% chance of avoiding long-term poverty. If you sow these things early in life, 90% chance that you're not gonna be really poor all your life. Number one, finish high school. Number two, Take a job. If you're not continuing your education back beyond that, get a job, any kind of a job. Just get in the workforce because you get experience. Number three, don't have a baby until you get married. Uh, single mothers struggle financially. Number four, Marry wisely. The best premarital advice I give somebody is marry the right person. It makes, it makes life a lot easier. 
Marry the right person. Don't marry a slob, okay? Marry someone who's stable, someone who's kind, someone who's a hard worker. And number five, he said, stay out of trouble. You don't want to spend your life in jail. Stay out of trouble. Five simple steps. Young people to sow those seeds. I got two more scriptures. Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 1. Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 1. So this principle is throughout the spectrum of the Holy Scriptures. Different ones have written about it. Solomon did. He said, cast your bread upon the waters, for you will find it after many days. Comes back. Feed the fish. They'll get big. You can eat them. <laughs> so if you have a fish farm. Here are some things, you know, the list is endless, of, of, of things to sow in our lives. Because this is a beautiful time of the year. I really enjoy the, the quiet serenity here, the, you know, the openness, the plants out there, the trees. Beautiful time of the year. It's a time for growth. And uh, it's a time for horticulture. So let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1. I'll just read uh, verses 5 to 8. Some things to be sowing. But also for this very reason, give, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. This is sowing spiritually. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. This is beautiful, the summary of it, verse eight. It says, for if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Guaranteed to produce good fruit. Another story. World War II produced a lot of heroes. One such hero was Lieutenant Commander Butch O'Hare. He was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington in the South Pacific. One day his entire squadron was set out on a mission. After he was airborne, he looked at his fuel gauge and he realized that someone had forgotten to top off his fuel tank. He would not have enough fuel to complete his mission and get back to the ship, the aircraft carrier. His flight leader told him to return to the carrier. Reluctantly, he dropped out of formation, headed back to the fleet. As he's returning, returning to the mother ship, he saw something that made his blood turn cold. Coming at him, a squadron of Japanese aircraft, Japanese Zeros, speeding on their way to the American fleet. The American fighters had gone out on a sortie. Fleet was all but defenseless. He couldn't reach the squadron to bring them back in time to save the fleet, nor could he warn the fleet of approaching danger. And there were certain radio issues. There was only one thing for him to do. He had to divert the Japanese fighters. So laying aside all thought of personal safety, he dove into the formation of Japanese aircraft. The wing-mounted 50 calibers blazed as he charged in, attacking one surprised aircraft after another. Butch dove in and out of the now broken formation, fired at as many planes as he possibly could until he used up all his ammunition. Undaunted, he continued the assault. He dove at the planes, trying to clip a wing or a tail in hopes of damaging as many aircraft as possible, making them crash. Finally, you know how sometimes you get a bunch of mosquitoes and you know, 
is this guy, you, know, you get out of there. Finally, the Japanese were exasperated. They took off another, another direction. Deeply relieved, Butch O'Hara and his tattered fighter limped back to the carrier. He landed. Upon arrival, he reported and related the event. What happened? The film from the gun camera mounted on the plane told the tale. They watched the film. It showed the extent of his daring attempt to protect the fleet. In fact, he had destroyed five enemy aircraft. This took place on February 20th, 1942. And for that action, Butch became the Navy's first ace of World War II and the first naval aviator to win the Medal of Honor. Unfortunately, a year later, he was killed in aerial combat when he was 29 years of age. His hometown would not allow the memory of this World War II hero to fade. To honor him, they changed the name of the airport from Orchard Depot to O'Hare International in 1949 in Chicago. Next time you find yourself at O'Hare Airport International, uh, you might want to stop uh, the display they have there, a beautiful display, and it's located between Terminal 1 and Terminal 2 in a little alcove there. And it gives a little bit of history and uh, the sculptures. What do these two stories have to do with each other? Butch O'Hare was as Easy Eddie's son. He was Easy Eddie's son. Easy Eddie reaped what he sowed, shot down by the mob, but also Easy Eddie planted some seeds of redemption. Some say that Butch O'Hare was accepted into the Naval Force Academy because of what his father had done to bring down Al Capone, possibly. In the long run, what we sow is what we reap. We need to live our, day, our, our, our lives day by day knowing that we have the results in our lives based upon a seed that we plant. God says, so to the Spirit. He encourages us to bear good fruit. And he will be so pleased to harvest the first fruits and then the latter harvest, which we can help him with.